the light on? <laughs> it's too bright on you. Okay. Oh, wait, one question. For oh, one second. I'm sorry. This iPhone was sitting over here. Does this belong to anyone? That's right. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone just sent the text. I won't say it. So if you're, is this it an iPod or iPod? Oh, it's an iPod. I didn't even it's look. Mine. A deal. Okay. <laughs> I feel like we should clap. You won something. Here, you won an iPod. <laughs> you should have read the text to us. <laughs> Only I know. I know the text. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Raymond. It's Woody's birthday. Oh, cool. yeah. 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 Um, Dan is. <laughs> you got to play from there, right? All right, so you got to sing really loudly because Dan's playing back there. Happy birthday to you. to our next guest, but he doesn't want that. He's Raymond Neutra. He graduated from Happy Valley School in 1957, and he served on the board of the Happy Valley Foundation for 25 years. He's going to speak to us about how modernism came to the West. We're going to have a brief question and answer afterwards. And uh, Raymond Neutra. So it all started with a Grunion run. Who knows what a grunion run is? That is right. That is right. Now, how is that related to modernism? Here's a grunion run. Uh, every summer at full <coughs> moon, these little fish come up and lay eggs on the beach. And as a 14-year-old, uh, I took a unauthorized. Uh, a visit with my buddies and I'm sorry to say a six pack of beer to go to the Santa Monica Beach. And when I got home at three in the morning there was a note on my bed that said, Raymond, where are you? And as a result, I was condemned to come to this school. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, at the corner there is the founder of the school, Rosalind Rajagopal, and this is the class of 1957, uh, and I'm the guy sort of up there. And um, this picture is of me playing Petruchio and Peggy Shaw playing Blanca in The Taming of the Shrew. Uh, Fifty years later, after our spouses died, Peggy and I got married, so... Um, uh, we weren't boyfriend and girlfriend, just good friends, but... Uh, so, the question is, why this particular school? And the, and the answer to this is tied up also to why your school looks the way it does, and why um, uh, modernism, modern architecture, came uh, to California. And it's partly related to this man, who was a Dutchman. A Dutch uncle who boosted California <coughs> modern and got me to Besson Hill School. And here he is, Case van der Leo. Now, I'm going to talk to you about influence diagrams about how things that were developed in architecture in Japan influence Frank Lloyd Wright, who in turn influenced a Dutch architect named Berlage, who in turn influenced a whole generation of Dutch architects in the 19 teens and 20s. And also influenced my father and his older friend, Rudolf Schindler, 
in Austria. And they and everybody in Europe were influenced by a guy named Adolf Loos. And somehow this is all related to how I ended up at the school. Because van der Leo uh, was a patron to both those Dutch architects and to my father, and that had a big influence on what happened in California. So this is my father. Uh, in 1930, you know in 1929 there was a big economic depression in the United States. There was no work. And he had been in the United States for seven years, and there was no work, and he decided to go back to Europe by way of Japan to uh, attend the second meeting of all the architects who were interested in modern architecture that was going to happen in Brussels. And kind of to his surprise, when he got to Japan, he discovered that things that he'd been doing for the last seven years as an immigrant to the United States had made him quite famous. And this was an announcement of a lecture uh, that he gave there. And then later, when he got to Germany, he was invited to lecture all over the place. And the question is, why? what had he done here in California uh, that had warranted all this attention? Well, the first thing was that there was a big, in 1926, a big competition uh, for the design of the new League of Nations building, which was the precursor to our United Nations. And he and his friend Rudolf Schindler uh, won an honorary award, and of the 377 entrants, there was just a handful of them that were modernist uh, uh, designs, and they went on tour. The Neutra Schindler, the Le Corbusier, and a guy named Hannes Meyer. So, that had made him well known. And then, in, also in 1926, he had written a book uh, in German about how America builds. And America was way ahead technologically of Europe at that point. We were building skyscrapers. We had uh, all kinds of industrial materials that we could assemble into buildings. And people in Europe, in Russia, this book was translated into Russian, it was in South America, Japan, read this book, uh, and were very interested in it. Uh, and in the book were designs of modernist uh, cities, and down in the corner you see a kind of a round form. That was a prefabricated metal school with indoor-outdoor uh, uh, teaching and all kinds. And the idea was it would be prefabricated, and uh, the way to get enough good schools was to have it built like a Henry Ford built Model A cart. And then finally, he was able to build this uh, building in 1929, where everything was assembled uh, just like in a car, that the, uh, all the steel structure were pre-cut and were just simply bolted into place on this hillside. Uh, the windows were factory uh, casement windows that were uh, bolted into the frame. Those round uh, lights there are Model A headlights. Uh, and this is what the, the building looks like now. Uh, this lady has been living, she's the third owner and has lived there since 1960. So, when my father arrived in Europe, he got a telegram in Switzerland from a Mr. Vandaleo, who he didn't know, saying, I've read your book and I want to meet you. I'm going to be in Switzerland. Can you meet me on such and such a day? And my father thought he was a reporter and uh, said, sure, I'll come down and, and meet you. When he got to, came down the stairs after Mr. Van der Leo had rung the bell in the apartment house in Basel, Switzerland, he came out and there was Mr. Van der Leo in a big Packard uh, limousine with a chauffeur. And uh, it turned out that he was a multimillionaire industrialist uh, who uh, had built lots of modern buildings in Holland, and he invited my father, and he said, look, uh, my architect, Leonard van der Vloot, has designed this house for me, and I want you to stay at my house, uh, with its spiral staircase and 
walkie-talkies and buttons that open and close the curtains and it was ultra-modern building nearly 80 years ago. Uh, and I'm going to take you to my factory that I've researched carefully. It's the healthiest factory in the world. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce you to some of the other architects in Holland and you're going to give lectures all over the place. Uh, open air school. And it turned out that this man had something to do with all of that activity of Mr. Van der Leeuw. Does anybody know who this is? Krishnamurti. So Krishnamurti had been discovered by the Theosophical Movement in India. And at this particular point in the mid-20s, it was believed that there would be a mystical transformation of him and that he would be able to have a new world movement. And so the elite young men at the top of the uh, society in Holland and many parts of Europe and the United States were forming committees to try to prepare for this event and to have an alternative to the Bolshevik solution to the great uh, economic injustices that were characteristic of the 1910s and 20s all over the world. And uh, Van der Leo, who's this guy here, uh, was assigned to study management and labor relationships and uh, healthy workplaces. And uh, in this lineup is Krishnamurti. And this man up here is Mr. Rajagopal, who later married the woman who founded this school. <coughs> and so, van der Leo was in charge of all the building for the Theosophical Society in Holland. And uh, this was some of the housing on a Theosophical camp there in Holland. Uh, this was a Theosophical temple. And uh, this was the factory. And van der Leo paid a lot of attention to make sure that this was really a healthy and delightful place to work for people who were packaging tea, coffee, and tobacco. And so, for example, that crossbar up there on the window was placed high so that the workers who were sitting at their tables and packaging things wouldn't have their view interrupted was a lot of attention, for example, to light. Uh, when they were designing the factory, this was a room that was used for uh, roasting coffee. And the original engineer had put beams between those columns to give it strength. And Van der Leo said, but if you do that, it's going to be very dark. I want to have light come and spill across the ceiling and reflect down into the room so the workers can see what they're doing. Can't you think up of another way of doing it? And so they came up with this mushroom kind of uh, structure that was very strong. And you see all those grooves there in the columns, those made it possible to, if you wanted to, to put partitions in so it could be very flexible to move that uh, thing around. And today, this factory has been turned into a design center. So there are lots of architects, web designers, graphic designers that work in this place. And this is the cafeteria now. Uh, back in the day, the workers in the 1920s did not have showers or baths in their house. So Van der Leo provided them with baths, the men on one floor, and then the alternate floor, the women. <coughs> And to keep the men and women separate, there were separate stairways that they would go to get to those bathrooms, and here's what those bathrooms looked like. And this was where the secretaries were. And then at the top of the, uh, the factory was a place where the sultans from Java and Indonesia, which were colonies of the Dutch in those days, would come and have coffee and discuss the prices that they were going to charge for the tea and coffee and tobacco that they were sending to Mr. Van der Leo. So it turned out then that 
<coughs> Mr. Bender Leo and my father had a lot of common interests. They were both interested in healthy architecture, about uh, ergonomics, about the physiology of perception, <coughs> and the importance of having the architecture respond to what was going on inside of it, instead of just being an artistic expression. <coughs> and ultimately, he went on, Case van der Leyen went on to become a doctor and got psychoanalyzed by Sigmund Freud in, in Vienna. <coughs> so again, Japan, right, then right at the Dutch, and then Los, influencing all the European architects. Now, who knows what this is? Go ahead, Ashley. Neuschwanstein. And it looks like it was built in the 1200s, but in fact it was built in 1870. It was kind of a fantasy castle of King Ludwig. And uh, in it, the charm of Neuschwanstein was that it had beautiful decorations that were very expensive, very expensive material, enormous rooms, and, uh, and, and an appeal to all kinds of historical fantasy. But there came to be a rebellion against this kind of architecture particularly when people would say, look, this guy is building his big castle up here and there are millions of people living in slums that don't have schools. We have to buckle down and have a different kind of architecture. And this guy, Adolf Loos, who was my dad's teacher and Rudolf Schindler's teacher, said that, you know what, ornament is a kind of crime. You should never be ornamenting any buildings. You should have no ornamentation. Uh, rather that we should celebrate what the actual materials are instead of carving them up and gilding them. And we should use, we should never make one material look like another material. And an architect is not an artist. He can't indulge himself. He's a craftsperson who is working on behalf of his client. Uh, and he built the building in 1905 opposite the palace of Emperor Franz Joseph, who didn't like it very much and said the building had no eyebrows. And this is a, a detail of that building. You can see that beautiful bronze and, and marble and so forth, but no decoration. And this is one of Adolf Loos's last buildings in Prague. And you can see it's very simple. You can see there's a beautiful garden, but notice there's no connection between the garden and the inside. You look through those windows to a completely different world. But Frank Lloyd Wright, who had seen Japanese architecture, uh, decided that there was a different way of looking at the relationship between indoors and outdoors. So this building here is not a mid-century modern uh, California uh, modern building. This was built around the time of Sir Isaac Newton in the mid-1600s in Kyoto. And you can see how there's this connection between the outdoors and the indoors. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright published his work up to that point in this book, which is called the Wasmuth Portfolio. And it's very rare now, you can go to the Getty, use the Getty Research Institute and they only have one of them, which belong to Frank Lloyd Wright's son. <coughs> and this guy in Holland, Berlage, uh, read, that, uh, read that booklet that Frank Lloyd Wright had paid himself to have done and got so interested that he went to the United States and saw those buildings and then came back with photographs and, and wrote his own book about it. This is his own work in, uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, and this is, these are the kinds of drawings that he saw inside that book. So what is the difference between this 
building, and the building that you saw of Adolf Loos, that white building that I commented on. Eyebrows? Eyebrow. <laughs> yeah. It explodes the box. It explodes the box. You, instead of a box with little holes in it, you've got a series of vertical and horizontal planes. You're reaching out into nature. And the Dutch, who learned about uh, Wright through Berlager, uh there were kind of three reactions to this. There was one group who kind of honed in on the pure aesthetics of it. They were called the De Stijl group. Uh, then there was another group who were interested in how Frank Lloyd Wright paid attention to what people did and how they interacted in the space. Uh, and how he used new kinds of technology like reinforced concrete to do his work instead of piling bricks on top of each other. And then there was a third group that was more interested in the more uh, imaginative shapes that Wright had. And I'm going to show you some pictures of those people's uh, work. So this is Frank Lloyd Wright exploding the box. And here's a Dutch architect who imitated Wright in 1919, another guy who was imitating Wright, uh, Rietveld, very influenced by Wright, exploding the box. Uh, and this fellow, Jan Doker, influenced by Wright, you can see the, the influence there, and he's using new reinforced concrete systems in the early 20s and building this sanitarium, <coughs> which uh, uses lots of glass, is, is, is sending these little fingers out into nature, opening up to nature. And this school, also using this <coughs> idea of an open-air school, as my father had talked about a decade earlier, uh, the kids were supposed to wear hats to keep the sun off them, but they were breathing fresh air so they wouldn't get tuberculosis. And this school has been in continuous use since 1928. And you can see those uh, factory metal doors there that open out onto the, uh, onto the balcony. Uh, the American history of modernism has tended to ignore these functionalist Dutch architects because the American art historians who were writing the story were kind of against people who only thought that architecture should serve a function and wasn't an art. And uh, so they've been kind of uh, ignored until rather recently uh, in the United States. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright, in the mid-20s, had started doing this kind of work, which was more boxy and looked kind of like a Mayan uh, a temple. And the third group uh, in Holland uh, were sort of interested in that kind of architecture. This is some of their uh, reaction to Frank Lloyd Wright. Rudolf Schindler, my father's uh, older uh, friend, was doing this kind of modern work after he quit working for Frank Lloyd Wright in California. You can go and visit this place in Los Angeles. Uh, that's another one of his buildings. So uh, after this tour with Van der Leo, a year later, another telegram arrived. And uh, this time he said, I'm in New York. I'm lecturing about factories. And I want to come out and see your work. We had such a good time together in Holland. Uh, and so he flew out, and my dad took him around Los Angeles, showed him his work and Schindler's work and some of the other early moderns in Los Angeles. And at the end of the day, he uh, was dropping Van der Leo off at the uh, hotel. And Van der Leo said, by the way, where's your house? And my dad said, well, I just rent a bungalow. I can't afford to build a house. And Van der Leo reached into his vest pocket and pulled out his checkbook and his pen and said, how much do you need? And my dad kind of stammered. And finally, he named a, a number for a loan that was equivalent to half the price of a typical house. In 1931, that was only $3,000. <laughs> uh, so uh, 
this was the kind of thing that my father never could have gotten from the bank because the kind of experimental house that he wanted to build was way too unconventional. And my mom and dad were thrilled to uh, get this money. And uh, this was what that first iteration of the house looked like. Uh, it had a lot of the features that California <coughs> Modern would have from then on. This is 1932, uh, 81 years ago. Uh, that those overhangs uh, with a light strip along so that you could see outside at night. Uh, vertical awnings that came out of those overhangs to keep the sun out when the sun was out and then could be cranked back up when the sun was not out. Uh, use of Dutch silver paint that he picked up from the Dutch. Uh, in many, lots of mirrors to make the space look larger. And this is the view out of the living room of that house uh, um, with same kind of folding metal doors that you saw in Holland that opened to this space. Uh, this is what the inside of that uh, place was like, and you can see how that outside lighting allowed you to look outside the windows rather than the reflection of what's inside at night. Uh, see my dad sitting there in the corner in on that uh, balcony. Uh, using a lot of warm materials. The, the walls were lined with masonite, which is a kind of inexpensive thing that most people used in their garages and that were waxed so that it really looked nice. Um, and then this person is Rosamund Rajagopal, and that's how she looked at that time. And she was a friend of Thunder Leo, because as you remember, Roger Paul was there in Holland. They'd all visited there. And she heard of this new architect and decided that she would have him design this place in 1935. And, and that's what it looked like from uh, the in, inside. So uh, their family has owned that place until just recently. They just sold it. Uh, and uh, a couple of years ago, I went and took these pictures, and it was essentially the same with the old 1935 <coughs> stove and, and, and what have you. Very compact little place. So uh, my parents in Roslyn stayed friends for all that period of time. And when I went off on that Grenadian hunt, then it was it made sense that I should be sent to the school that Roslyn had started just 10 years before. Um, and this is a house here in Ojai. Uh, this is a house that was built prefabricated steel panels for the director Joseph von Sternberg, who was the one who brought the actress Marlena Dietrich to uh, the United States. Has anybody heard about heard of Marlena Dietrich? And then there was a big earthquake, and my father finally was able to build one of his modern schools. Uh, and uh, it had big steel sliding doors to get people in and out and teach uh, in the open air. Uh, and then 10 years later, he was invited to uh, design a whole series of rural schools in the island of Puerto Rico and hospitals and health centers, uh, and developed a, a particular uh, system of uh, reinforced concrete because they had a lot of earthquakes on those islands. You remember Haiti had that big earthquake a few years ago. Uh, and this, and that was published widely all through South America in a Brazilian publication. And this school here is not a Neutra school, but is one of 10,000 uh, uh, schools that were built in Mexico uh, in imitation of those uh, schools. And this is a, a mansion in Havana that used that same system. So I'm going through real quickly. So this was the little office, and this, you, you won't, see many pictures of that office that was in that house because it was illegal and also there were only nine people working there and they 
designed about 300 projects over a 40-year period. My dad didn't want to advertise how small his office was. But there were these four guys who ended up being heads of departments of architecture. Uh, I'm going to go through that. These, this is their work. And, and they taught people uh, who, in turn, did similar kind of work. Including the guy who designed this place. Mm -hmm. Does anyone recognize this place? <laughs> the school that you work uh, in live in was designed by Paul Sterling Hogue, who also worked with my father and with uh, uh, Rudolf Schindler. And then there was a whole program called the Case Study House, uh, where uh, a magazine paid architects after World War II to use industrial materials to build new housing. My father participated in that, and a lot of the architects who participated either started in his office or uh, were taught by people who started in his office. So California Modern then, uh, high tech California Modern really started in that place that the Theosophist Case van der Leo uh, made possible. And I will this is what the place looks like now. You can visit it. And there's my dad sitting on the roof of that place looking at the shallow reflection pool on the roof. So I'm done. We have a few minutes for questions. Okay. Um, so I mean, your dad was a rock star of architects. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this. There's Beethoven and the Beatles and Picasso and Rembrandt. His dad and, and Frank Lloyd Wright and some of these other guys were rock stars. Were they recognized as that in their time? By the time I was born, my dad was on the cover of Time magazine. So yeah, he was recognized. Uh, all right. yeah. Uh, one other question. The graph where you could, with the arrows back to this guy, to that guy, to that, and wound up in Japan. Yeah. Who were the, I've never heard of the Japanese guys that are the Japan portion of that. Uh, well, of course, this is traditional Japanese architecture. So there's no historical? So, well, uh, we know who, who the guys were who designed them, but they were 400 years ago. Uh, they, uh, um, uh, they were discovered in the eight, just around the same time that Neuschwanstein was being built. People were starting to come back from Japan and, and, and see what they were seeing there and say, these guys have a completely different way of dealing with stuff. And um, many of these designs were done by uh, Zen Buddhists who understood the importance of simplicity. And the people who were also saying, we need to have a simple architecture that's affordable for everybody, but yet is beautiful, uh, could then go back and say, well, what is our relationship to beautiful things? Do we have beautiful things to flaunt our wealth, the way Neuschwanstein was? Or uh, do, is, is beauty something that everybody can appreciate if they're educated to see it? <coughs> So the Zen uh, samurai who's become a monk now uh, is walking along the path and notices the cherry blossoms have fallen on the uh, rainy uh, cobblestones and sees a beautiful pattern. It doesn't cost him anything to appreciate that. Uh, so Japanese culture is uh, traditionally imbued with a sense of appreciation of simple, beautiful things. And this came as a revelation to the architects who'd been building Neuschwanstein's instead of building libraries and schools and houses for everybody. So there are names associated with that Japanese group, though, just as all the, you had all those other right. names for the modern. But interestingly enough, 
the Japanese modernists were people who then went to study with Frank Lloyd Wright and rediscovered their own tradition uh, uh, from the Westerners who reappreciated it. Before that, the Japanese architects were imitating the more ornate uh, Western architecture. So they kind of learned to rediscover their own tradition from people in the West who pointed it out to them. That's water on the roof? That's water. For what purpose? Uh, partly because on the, uh, over to this side there is a reservoir and this, if you're inside that penthouse and sitting on the floor, this links the roof to that visually to the reservoir and partly because it's constantly evaporating and keeping the house cool inside. Um, I was wondering, at one point you said that um, your father's teacher um, said something about how um, architects aren't so much artists in their own sense, but just um, building for their employer. Um, yeah. Like, what's your opinion about that? Um, uh, look, a craftsman can build beautiful things, right? So Beatrice Wood could throw a pot that was beautiful, but it's also useful. Um, Shaker furniture, if you're familiar with that. Um, uh, American religious group uh, build beautiful furniture, very simple furniture, but you could sit on it. Uh, but then, frankly, Frank Lloyd Wright designed some interesting looking furniture, but you wouldn't want to sit on it. So uh, I agree with my father that I think that uh, the constraints of serving what people do, how they interact, and what they experience, and that what they experience should be healthy for them and delightful for them, that that is a constraint that uh, architects ought to follow. Right. Dan? Uh, sir, I'm very curious. Because like this building I built like 1920, uh, like 1929, 30, how can it keep so perfectly to now? Ah, good question. Those pictures, particularly of the Dutch things, uh, they had been restored. That, that sanitarium had fallen into disuse. And uh, uh, a very skillful architect uh, figured out how to restore it and at the same time use it in a new way. It's no longer a tu tuberculosis sanitarium, but it's a, uh, a place for physiotherapy for people that have broken a leg or something like that. And they come there temporarily and, and live in that place. The factory that I showed you, uh, the company that owned it, uh, knew that they needed a new factory, and they went to the city of Rotterdam and said, we understand that this is a monument in modern architecture, and, and but we're going to be moving out of here. Uh, we would like to cooperate with your government to try to find a new use for it that would keep it going. And they had a request for proposal from a number of developers, and then they got several of them together, and said, look, what we'll do is make this a design center. It's such a beautiful building, and we'll make offices in here. And good old van der Leo had made it so flexible that it was possible to repurpose that building. And now it's a vibrant place doing something completely different. But there's one room in there that fascinated me. The ceiling had a kind of a coffee color. And I said, what is the uh, cement look this funny color, and they said, well, this was the room where they steamed the tobacco uh, uh, because the tobacco had come in big blocks and they needed to un, uh, un, kind of unglue it. And all the nicotine went up into the, in the concrete, and we just can't get the concrete out. We tried to paint over it, and the nicotine keeps coming through, so we just gave up. And uh, uh, so that was the one remnant of the original use.
Yeah. How big is the influ influence of this architecture in today's ar architecture, and how much did today's architecture <coughs> develop from that? So are you from Germany? Yes. So <laughs> what happens, uh, there's an interesting German story about this that I just learned. I was in, uh, in uh, Frankfurt uh, this summer, and an architect there gave me a book that explained that after World War II, the Germans uh, had a big soul searching about what new direction to go in. And during the Nazi period, there had been this very heroic, imposing architecture to intimidate people with the power of the Nazi party and so forth. And they for sure were not going to do that, continuing that line. And they decided that that the Germans in the Bauhaus and, and uh, people like Gropius and Mies and so forth uh, had really been early big boosters of this kind of functional architecture. And uh, so that they would go back to that tradition of the Weimar Republic. And they looked around the world to see, well, where are people building like that? Well, the old masters, Gropius and Nice, were now academics and had not built anything. The Corbusier had not built anything. But where <clears throat> modernism was happening was here in California with the uh, case study house. So there's um, uh, a lot of German publications in the 40s and 50s of California modern architecture. And to this day, German modern architecture is more like this <coughs> than uh, some of the other uh, traditions. And in fact, there's something called the Consular Bungalow, which was uh, built by an architect named Sepp Ruf, uh, which looks just like my father's work because he was a big admirer of my father and invited him to lecture there. So uh, probably in the world, German architecture is closest to this uh, tradition with a lot of attention to passive solar, um, devices in um, green architecture and, and paying attention to what people do in interesting kinds of ways. Less so in the United States, which is going more to the architect, artist architects like uh, Lou Gehry in um, um, no, DJ, uh, Frank Gehry in the uh, Disney Theater in Los Angeles, which is a more expressionist kind of architecture. All right, that's it. Raymond Norton. We have music? <laughs> yes. <Okay. clears throat> um, music today is 